Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Discovery Days and Health Sciences here with Hamilton Health Sciences and also supported by St. Joseph's Healthcare and McMaster University. Okay, so really why we're here on this platform is to hear our keynote lecture. And just before we do, I'm going to turn the podium over to Daniela Bianco from Hamilton Health Sciences, um, the host of the event today. And uh, Daniela is going to welcome you on behalf of her. Thank you, Lisa, and um, good morning. Welcome and thank you, students and teachers, um, for your interest in health sciences. My name is Daniela Bianco, and I'm the Manager of Research Development and Relation at Hamilton Health Sciences. Today, you are in the right place to learn about careers in medicine and related health professional roles. We hope to give you a glimpse into some of the great career opportunities to help influence inspire and possibly impact the tough choices you face in selecting your future academic studies. I'm just gonna give you a bit of a snapshot of the Hamilton landscape. Uh, Hamilton is one of the most influential research communities in the world. Traditionally known as Heal Town, we have seen a bit of a renaissance over the past 15 to 20 years, I'd say, where we've become a health research hub. We have three institutions that we work together that Lisa's already touched on. We work very collaboratively with our McMaster University University, as well as St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. HHS is, is home to over 450 researchers, as well as over 1,300 research staff members who support their work carried out at the, at the auspices of our facilities and joint research institutes. We have one of Canada's largest biobanks facilities that has approximately 3.9 million samples where the biobank collects, analyzes, and analyzes human blood, urine tissue, and DNA samples for use in international research studies. It supports clinical trials, biobanking, biochemistry, and genetic testing research. It has 60 liquid nitrogen tanks that store samples at minus 160 degrees Celsius. And tanks are monitored 24 seven and operate on an automated system that replenishes nitrogen on demand. So we have consistently placed as an organization in terms of our research activity in the top five of Canada's top 40 research hospitals. So just a little bit of some highlights of research at Hamilton Health Sciences. We serve a patient population of approximately 2.3 million people across the South Central Ontario region. HHS is comprised of six hospitals and six specialized facilities with more than 15,000 staff physicians and volunteers. We have five joint research institutes and centers with our affiliate institute at Master University that conducts the majority of our research activities in Hamilton, with the rest carried out by individuals and or groups within the research, the general research community at HHS. Here's a snapshot of some of our, our strengths. So uh, research work is centered around finding cost-effective solutions, preventative strategies for global populations, and strong recruitment and retention learner training mentorship. We do have state-of-the-art facilities that serve as incubators um, that aim to solve medical mysteries that plague our modern society and the developing world. HHS is strongly supportive of its research community and is leading multiple initiatives to bring our hospitals and facilities at the forefront of digital health innovation. So we're actually seeing a, a trend in an emerging field of a hospital without walls, without border research, without borders. So you're seeing a lot of virtualization of care and the patient and family members becoming key players in, in, in their care that's provided to them. So it's an exciting era to be part of where healthcare is going in the future. And you'll be a part of that as you pursue your studies. So our hope for you today is that you know you make the most of the planned activities they will give you a better understanding of the career and opportunities within your reach we are hamilton health sciences is extremely proud to offer this par program in partnership with the canadian medical hall of fame i think it's our ninth or tenth year i think it's our ninth consecutive year our second virtual experience so it gives me great pleasure to be a part of this program we've been able to improve it year after year so the feedback that you do provide is integral, so please um, share your comments and, and feedback on your experience today. And on that note, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Kay Wu, who is our population health research keynote lecturer. So I just have a brief bio here to share with you. Kay Wu, a creative at heart, dreams of using technology and innovation to take healthcare to new heights. 
Her work towards this goal centers around technological advancement, innovative delivery of medical education, and fostering communities of health innovators. As clinical advisor to McMaster's Innovators in Scrubs, Kay and her team have created a prototype of a natural language processing tool to improve patient understanding of medical reports. A finalist in the biotech pitch competition, this tool garnered the support of Joseph Brandt Hospital and will soon be piloted. Recognizing the need for virtual care training during the pandemic, Kay spearheaded MaxSim, a novel, immersive, and technology-enhanced case simulator. Hundreds of medical students and physicians gained clinical decision-making and communication skills through this initiative, which she presented at the Canadian Conference of Medical Education. Fascinated by the potential of machine learning, Kay led a research team at the MIT COVID-19 Datathon, focusing on the impact of the pandemic on marginalized communities. She also helped to organize the inaugural MIT Hacking Racism and Healthcare Hackathon, an unprecedented space for collaboration among over 500 patient and health professionals to code novel solutions to dismantle racial injustice in healthcare delivery and address the social determinants of health. Outside of medicine, Kay unleashes her creativity, painting and writing stories. So Kay, welcome, and I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Daniela and Lisa. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be speaking to you all today. So my name is Kay. I just graduated from medical school at McMaster University. I'm originally from Scarborough, but I know that if I was from Hamilton, younger me would have loved to participate in an event like this. So I think it's so amazing that all of you are here today to take the time to really learn and explore a potential career for you. Today, I would like to share a few things that I have learned throughout my journey of pursuing a career in medicine. And in, this is insight that I hope will also be helpful for you as you move forward on your journey today and in the future. So the first thing that I want to talk to you all about is fear. I remember the first time that I had to give a presentation in middle school. It was for English class. I had to speak for 10 minutes about a book that I had read. And let me tell you, I was terrified. I remember spending hours and hours the night before preparing. I remember I lay in bed hoping for some reason or another that my presentation would be delayed and I wouldn't have to go. Of course, that didn't happen, and I remember the day of going up in front of the class, feeling really nervous, butterflies in my stomach, my hands clammy. So at the time, public speaking was one of the biggest fears that I had in my life. I'm an introvert. I was a shy kid. Um, I was an only child growing up in an East Asian immigrant family. And so there were many cultural expectations and family dynamics that played out in my life. There was a strong focus on education, on doing well in school, on being very studious. And my mother worked long hours and I didn't have any siblings. So most of the time I was on my own doing my own thing. And so because of all this, socializing was actually secondary. And um, so I always found it difficult to speak up, much less give a presentation. And I remember that when I was younger, I was very frustrated about this. Throughout my childhood, I wished that I could just be someone else, someone different, someone who wasn't afraid to go up in front of a big audience and just talk. One day, when I was browsing through social media, I came across this diagram. It reads, this problem or situation that I'm dealing with, can I influence the outcome? And it's a pretty simple diagram. There's only two options. But for me, this is an approach to problems that really just clicked with me. For all of my worries and fears that I had, including my fear of public speaking, a way to approach it productively was to think, was there anything I could actually do about it? If not, then why worry? But if yes, I could influence this worry or fear, that meant I could improve things. I could take action in order to lessen the worry or fear that I felt. And this fear that I felt provided me with the opportunity to grow. 
So when I was pursuing my bachelor's degree at Queen's University, I embraced this mindset of growth and of tackling my problems head on. I challenged myself to work on this fear of mine, this fear of public speaking. And so I came across speech masters. This was a club of 30 or so students um, that specifically helps people become comfortable with public speaking in a safe environment. On my very first meeting of speech masters, I remember summoning all of my courage and pushing myself to go up to give my first speech. It was scary, but I did it. And even though my heart was pounding the whole time, somehow I got through it. And then at the next meeting, I did it again. I kept going and going. Slowly, it became easier. And I eventually even found myself enjoying this process basking in the adrenaline, being with people who shared the same fears and goals that I did. The next year, I even became an executive member of the club, mentoring and helping other students overcome their fear. And while I can't say that the nerves totally disappeared, I learned to be okay with them. I once falsely believed that I was just not cut out for public speaking, but through this experience, I learned that I love the process of developing a speech and sharing it with my audience. I learned that I was stronger than my fear and that I could be an excellent public speaker. And it's why I'm able to do this in front of you all today. What I learned from my journey with public speaking is that there is tremendous capacity for growth in situations of fear or discomfort. As humans, we have so much potential. The brain is a highly active and malleable learning machine. And so with determination, what people can accomplish is incredible. We can overcome our fears and we are in control of the trajectory that our life takes. We can either let fear control us or we can learn to um, be the ones who control our fears. Learning to grow through challenging myself was the principle that helped me accomplish so much on my journey throughout my life and in medicine. This growth mindset was something that I applied to all things that were scary to me, the things that seemed important for me to achieve my goals. Besides public speaking, some other examples of things that I initially feared but challenged included leading a big team. I challenged this fear by becoming a director of STEM Fellowship, which is a national nonprofit focused on youth empowerment and STEM education for over 5,000 youth. In medical school, I was initially quite afraid of the thought of breaking bad news to patients. I challenged this fear by educating myself on frameworks for having difficult conversations, observing my supervisors when they did so, and on practicing whenever I could, whenever I had the chance to, in simulated patient encounters. And so today, I challenge you to think about what you are afraid of and why. What things have you been telling yourself about those fears? And are they getting in the way of achieving your dreams and living your best life? What if you could change that? What steps could you take to change those things? Do some brainstorming and reflecting. And if you need help, don't be afraid to go to your peers, friends and family and mentors for some input because Growth through conquering your fears is not only possible, but key to reaching your potential. The second thing that I want to talk to you about is love. Not romantic love, but your passions, the things that you love doing in life. A common situation that you might find yourself in is not knowing what you are passionate about. If you don't know what you love, how do you figure that out? Now, this is a very complicated and personal question. The concept of figuring out what you love um, doing in life is complicated for a few reasons. In this world, you are and will be subjected to many, many external influences from friends, family, social media, strangers. People will be telling you what you should be wanting and what you should be doing. It is important to know that while people may mean well and give you advice, at the end of the day, you know yourself best. So it's important to take the time to really ask yourself 
what do you really want out of life? What things pull at your attention or spark inner enthusiasm? And if you don't know the answer to these questions, that's okay. All you need is more time and more information. What this means is that you need to go out there and explore, so it's great that you're all here today. Brainstorm things to try and try new things. Take on any new opportunities that life throws at you. And reach out to people you admire or people whose lives and careers you're interested in and ask them about advice and how they came to be where they are. I also just wanna make a note here that your discovery of yourself and what you love is a continuous process. It's a journey in life and there is no set timeline for it. You may already know what you love or you may not know until years and years down the road. And that's okay. Do your best to learn about yourself and your interests through taking all of the chances that you have. And you are an, at an incredible position right now to do so. For myself, I have three loves, art, science, and technology. Ever since I was a kid, art has been a big hobby and love of mine. I love the humanities. I love being creative. I love painting and drawing. And sharing my art with people has been a way for me to connect with my community through posting my art on social media, getting my work published in magazines, teaching workshops and participating in conferences. But I also discovered a love for science. In high school, I was lucky to have an incredible teacher, Ms. Manier. Ms. Manier was incredible because she found ways for us to have fun in science and get hands-on opportunities while learning. A big highlight of my time in high school was when she organized an opportunity for us students to design a research experiment to send to space. Space is so cool. I got involved in this project and it was one of my first experiences with research. The experiment that my team and I came up with was to test how muscle changes when in space where there's very little gravity. And the goal of the project was to uh, understand a bit more about how neurologic disease can develop. Through this opportunity, my classmates and I were able to go all the way from designing the experiment proposal to testing the experiment in the lab and to actually sending it to the International Space Station and finally publishing our work. The picture at the bottom corner here is astronaut Jeffrey Williams interacting with our experiment on the International Space Station. And um, what we did was we put little uh, worm-like creatures called nematodes inside a tube, which he is holding right now and exposing it to um, the little gravity that there is in space. To this day, I still find it hard to believe that I was able to participate in so something so cool. And this particular experience really helped me discover my love for science. I was extremely privileged to get this opportunity, but exploring your interests doesn't mean you have to um, do something this extreme. It can be as simple as reading about a topic or having a conversation with an expert in it. And so on my journey of figuring out my passions, I found that I loved both art and science, two very different fields. I became interested in medicine in high school because I saw that it was a way for me to bring together my love for both art and science. Science, because medicine is a field that heavily relies on knowledge of human biology and on continued scientific advancement for diagnosis and treatment. But medicine is also an art because it is a field where the doctor-patient relationship is so key. And so it naturally involves the humanities. There's medical ethics, there's the art of patient interaction, there's a history of medicine, and so much more. And so knowing all this, I decided to pursue medicine. At Queen's University, I chose my undergraduate degree to be in life sciences. However, I went into undergrad with a mindset that I wanted to explore my interests. 
I love learning and I remember looking at the course catalog, wishing I just had enough time to take them all. Wishing if only I was Hermione Granger and I had a time turner to do it. But of course I didn't, so I needed to narrow it down. How I did so was I took some time to reflect on my childhood and the things that piqued my interest during that time. One thing that I recalled was that when I was younger, I loved building websites for fun. I also loved playing video games. Websites and video games. So I thought to myself, why not learn how to code? So I started taking computer science courses. And the learning curve was certainly steep, but I found myself loving it. I loved the problem solving of computer science the cool technology that was being developed with it, and the way that it was applicable to real life. And these courses weren't very related to medicine, but I liked it. And so I continued taking them throughout undergrad. When I finally got into medical school at McMaster, I further explored my interests in these three areas, arts, technology, medicine. And that was how I got involved with a group called Innovators and in Scrubs. This was a group of students from diverse backgrounds spanning medicine, business, engineering, computer science, that worked together to design solutions to problems in healthcare. So let me give you an example. A project that my teammate and I worked on was a web app that aimed to simplify patients' medical records to layperson terms so that patients would be able to better understand their own health conditions and treatments. And the goal of this was to empower patients to take a more active role in their own healthcare decision-making. And using my knack for creativity, design, and exper experiences in medicine, I collaborated with software engineering students, patients, and physicians to design a prototype for such a tool and to assess the potential impact of it. Our project won first place at the Delta Healthcare Innovation Conference, and we also had the opportunity to pitch our project to uh, Joseph Brandt Hospital leadership. We received a lot of we received a lot of positive feedback from that. And the project that I was involved in was a wonderful intersection of healthcare technology and medicine and creativity. These were all areas that I loved. Looking back on my winding journey in exploring these interests, it all made sense. During my time pursuing my interests early on, I encountered a lot of people questioning why I was pursuing and learning things that didn't seem all that related to medicine. But by continuing to stick with what I loved and what intuitively caught my interest and sparked my, in sparked my enthusiasm, I was able to eventually find this unique niche where all of my interests came together, the space of healthcare innovation. And it is because I continued to pursue these interests of mine that I ended up realizing that I wanted to become a radiologist. Radiology is a specialty in medicine that uh, where you interpret medical imaging. For example, seeing if there's a fracture on an x-ray. As, an, as I am an artist, I'm able to use my visual skills and my appreciation for the art of human anatomy in radiology. I am also able to indulge my interest in technology because radiology heavily involves imaging technology and computers and software. And what is so exciting about radiology is that there is so much innovation and in advancements going on. For example, the use of artificial intelligence to interpret imaging. And in fact, during medical school, one of the research projects that I personally worked on was using artificial intelligence to figure out in particular, whether a particular cancer that was being seen on imaging had certain characteristics that would make it more or less suitable for a particular treatment. And as healthcare data becomes more abundant, 
we will move towards a future in medicine where machine learning can be more and more utilized in order to diagnose, predict, and treat patients in the hopes of improving healthcare delivery in various dimensions, including improving care quality, improving care efficiency, and so much more. So it is such an exciting time to be in medicine with a lot of predicted changes on the horizon. What I want to get across to you all with this story of my journey in medicine and in exploring my interests is that as humans, it's so, it's so normal to have so many different interests. We live in an increasingly intertwined and interdisciplinary world. And medicine in particular is a very diverse field and your diverse interests may be useful to you in one way or another. And so I want to tell you that no matter what it is that interests you, take the time to explore it. Different fields, even if they may seem very different, may come together in an unexpected way. The picture that I have here is a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. And this is somebody who embodies diversity of interests and fearlessness in pursuing all of them. He was somebody who lived during the Italian Renaissance and had interest in art and technology, anatomy, astronomy, and a whole lot more and accomplished great things in these fields. The last thing that I want to talk to you about is failure. When I applied to medical school three years ago, I was waitlisted. It doesn't seem like a big deal looking back at it in hindsight, but I was devastated when I found out that day. After several days of feeling down about myself, I chose to treat myself with care and compassion. I spent time with friends and family and did some things I enjoyed outside of school and medicine, including traveling and making art. So I was able to rediscover my identity outside of being a pre-med. And I moved on. Think back to the flowchart that I showed you at the start. I realized then that there was nothing I could do to influence my waitlist result at that point. So I moved on to what I could influence, which was the future. I reflected on my journey as a pre-med up to that point. I thought about what I could have done differently. And I thought about what I wanted to do moving forward. I drafted a plan to finish up my undergrad take some more courses I was interested in, try some new volunteering experiences. And I moved on. But as luck would have it, I ended up getting off the waitlist for McMaster and went to medical school. But my message here is the same. The healthcare field, like many other things in life where there's limited capacity, is competitive to get into. There are many, many more qualified applicants than spots. And furthermore, even once you get in, that's only the beginning. In particular, if you're aiming to become a doctor, um, there's a residency match, you have to apply for fellowships after, and then it's time for the real world, which is when you apply for jobs. So in general, there are a lot of hoops to jump through for a career, and it's certainly not easy. And so as a human, you will fail at one point or another. It could be something small or it could be something big. Just like how I failed to be accepted into medical school right away. Failure is painful, but failure is also a great launching pad for growth. When you fail, one piece of advice that I have for you is to consider how you want to grow from it. Is this an opportunity to try again? If so, seek feedback on how you did go to trusted mentors and peers. See what advice they have to offer in this regard. Come up with ways you can improve and then summon the strength and resilience to keep going. Secondly, it is important that even when you fail, have faith in yourself. Failure says nothing about your value as a person. It is simply another step in the journey of life. Remind yourself that you're human. A career in healthcare is a journey and it is so important to practice self-care and self-compassion throughout. 
so that you don't burn yourself out. And there is so much more to the world than just medicine and pursuing a career in healthcare. Find the things that keep you grounded and sane. And don't be afraid to seek out your support system. Have faith in that as long as you continue to be true to yourself and your needs and interests, you will get to a good place. Imposter syndrome is so real in this field, but you must be your biggest fan or else who will be? Last month, I graduated from medical school at McMaster. This July, I will be starting residency at the University of Toronto for radiology, which has been my dream throughout medical school. And I'm still continuing to utilize all of the advice that I have put forward to you today as I continue on my own career journey. So to summarize the things that I've spoken to you about today, number one, fear and discomfort can really help you grow as a person. Number two, follow what innately excites you. If you don't know, that's okay, explore it. It's okay to pursue diverse interests because interdisciplinarity can lead to amazing things. And number three, failure is a great launching pad for growth. And have faith, for your, have faith in yourself as you continue on this journey. A decade ago, I was a shy girl who had a huge fear of public speaking and didn't think of myself as a leader of any kind. But since then, I've stepped out of my comfort zone more times than I can count, embracing the growth mindset so that I have been able to lead research projects, collaborate with numerous people as a part of nonprofit organizations, design prototypes to solve healthcare issues, and give this speech in front of you all today. And so I welcome and invite you all today to put some of this advice into practice. Today, you have an amazing opportunity to network, to ask questions, and to explore your interests in healthcare. So challenge yourself. If you aren't the type of person to ask questions, challenge yourself to ask just one. If you don't know anyone else who's attending today, go out there and make a connection with people. Really throw yourself into this marvelous opportunity today that you have to learn about the field of medicine and to grow as a person. There is so much that you can do. The possibilities are nearly endless in the exciting field of medicine and beyond. So thank you so much for listening and have fun. Wow, okay, thank you, thank you so much. That was such a great start to this day. Um, I love the simplicity of your slides, which echoed the simplicity of your message, even though you're talking about a really complex topic. Can I influence the outcome? I love the way you started um, on that whole notion of, you know, things happen. Can I influence the outcome or not? And if you can, then go on and do it. I think, uh, I think that along with everything else you've said has been a tremendous source of great advice. Um, really, really appreciate you being here today.